Uh, so welcome back to Perspectives on Bayesian Statistics in the Life Science. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you now to Professor Michael Goldstein from University of Durham. Uh, Michael will now talk about Bayesian uncertainty quantification for complex systems modeled by computer simulators. Michael is a professor of statistics uh, at the University of Durham and has worked throughout his career on the foundations, methodology and applications of Bayesian statistics. With a series of EPSRC grants, he developed the approach term based linear uh, analysis, and these developments have culminated in his textbook, Bayes Linear Statistics, Theory and Methods, published in 2007. Over the last 20 years, he has applied this approach uh, to uncertainty analysis for large-scale systems modeled via complex simulators with fun uh, complex simulators with funding from EPSRC, MRC, and these industri industrial contracts. So after this talk, we'll have a, a roundtable discussion with both speakers and uh, Dr. Richard Murray. So please give a warm welcome to Michael. Thank you. Hi, so I'm very happy to be here. So that's my title. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I need to view full screen. Perfect. Okay. So, yep. So, we have complex systems, which is most anything. We model them by computer simulators because that's what people do. Many uncertainty things are raised, so we quantify uncertainty. We do it in a Bayesian way, hence uh, my role in this workshop. I should thank many people for funding for the ideas that I'm going to talk about. In particular, the example that I'm going to uh, talk about, I was told to include a life sciences example. Hopefully this will be one. This corresponds to MRC funding. That was a study by many people listed there. I have a small part in that, and uh, that will provide my illustration. <coughs> so, complex physical s systems. Okay. Most things in the world that are complex we struggle to understand them, we build models, we run the models to help us understand them. Let me give you some examples. People who manage oil reservoirs. Okay, the oil reservoir is built, it has the, you want to know how should you run it, how should you manage the assets, how do you estimate oil, how do you do various things. A reservoir simulator <coughs> describes how the geology of the reservoir leads to uh, like good asset management. Okay, so it, it, it's a big simulator. Quite different, natural hazards, what we think we know about floods, volcanoes, tsunamis, our understanding of the dangers, again, come from, from models of these things. Disease modelling, that's the one that I'm going to use. When people think, worry about, is the disease going to spread? Will it die out? What are the effective interventions? People build models to understand that. Energy planning. All of the complicated energy questions, what do we build, how do we design auctions to guarantee supplies, numbers like that, 7% of, of energy uh, sort of requirements which Hinkley Point will address, things like this, all of these numbers come from large models. Climate change, everything we think we know about what will happen if we pump CO2 continuously into the atmosphere comes from large climate models. The universe. We think we, our attempts to understand the universe come from building galaxy simulation models. You start them with the Big Bang, you roll them forward with laws of physics we think we know, we compare them to what we see, and that helps us to refine our physical laws. <coughs> so now all of these are completely different. The science will be completely different. The underlying methodology for handling uncertainty will be the same. So how can I say that with any confidence? These are not six random applications. These are six things which I have I spent quite a lot of time working in. Okay? In each one of these areas, we've developed methods for handling uncertainty. The details of the simulators, the details of the models, the details of the real systems are different. The methods for handling uncertainty are the same. Okay? So when I say that uh, <coughs> this is a general methodology, that's what I mean. If you have a model that is complex, then it's quite likely that some of the things that I say will be uh, relevant to you. If you don't particularly, but your friend does, you could then tell them some of these things, perhaps. Okay. <coughs> so the example that I'm going to use, I could have pulled out any one of them. Okay, so this is a life sciences meeting. 
great. So I'm going to, so this is a life science thing. We'll talk about HIV modeling. So in particular, the case study, which all the people at the beginning were involved in, this is HIV transmission. It happens to be in Uganda. The methods are universal, obviously. So it's a sim simulator called Maquano. It's an agent-based model. So it's a dynamic stochastic individual-based computer model that simulates sexual partnerships and HIV transmission. So the lives of uh, individuals are simulated over time. Many individuals are simulated, okay, and uh, that, so we simulate the, the, the spread of the disease by simulating the individuals in the population. Each individual is fast to simulate. We simulate loads of people. That's what makes it a complex problem. So each individual has a series of characteristics, gender, date of birth, HIV status, etc. So changes in personal characteristics arise from things like the start and end of sexual relationships, and these events are stochastic. So the model contains randomizers for each individual. Okay? So individuals are born at random, they form relationships at random, they have sex at random, they may or may not get HIV at random, they leave relationships at random, they die at random. So it's quite poignant. I mean, it's kind of just like our life, isn't it? Okay, so this is just what happens to us, but all put together in, in, in a computer program. Okay. Then we've done this at the individual level. We now aggregate to say what we think will happen in the population. Okay. To go into a little bit more detail, but not much. So we've got birth, death, partnership formation, dissolution, and HIV transmission. These are on time-dependent rates. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So at birth, at random, a simulated individual can go into the high activity or low activity group, a high concurrency, i.e. lots of partners, or a low concurrency groups. So there are, each sexual activity group has various rates which determine how fast you form relationships, whether they're long duration or, or, or short duration. There are altogether in this model 20 behavioural and two epidemiological inputs. So the, 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 the uh, behavioural inputs are these things about sort of, the groups, the epidemiological ones <coughs> where they are, about, are, sort of, are, are always defined, about preferences within group and between group, etc. There are three calendar times for sort of young, middle aged and old to allow sexual sort of activity to change as people get older. Okay? So we have a model that it has altogether twenty two inputs describing these things. Now our reality check is that we have, why is this happening in Uganda, is that apparently, well, it's, as it is the case, that there was very detailed data that's been collected in certain regions in, in, in Uganda. So here's a cohort that was established in 1989, and every year data has been collected and questionnaires have been administered. Okay, so uh, there's data on individuals, HIV testing, and etc. So very detailed information at a particular level on a particular group. So now there are many features of this data. In the particular study, we're going to look at 18 particular outputs. So there will be things like HIV prevalences at particular times and etc. Okay, so there they are. Okay, and right. So we have a model. We have a, a rich data set. Okay, we want to use the data set to test and constrain and inform the model. Okay. <coughs> now, if you find this general area interesting, there is a reference which will take you through what we actually what was actually done. There are the authors again. There's there's a paper. Okay, and it will take you through in in much more detail than I can give here. Okay, if you think okay that's good because they've done even better. So here's a follow up paper which has now gone from history matching to, which will, will, I'll tell you what that is, to efficient history matching. So it's, we're now more careful how we do it, which also had talks about interventions and for a larger <coughs> model, same, the same authors. Okay. So now I want to tell you effectively how, you know, what are the methods you might use to handle models like that. You can see that they're generic. You have a model which is complex, it has many inputs, many outputs, and it relates to complex features of the real world. Okay. So I'm going to do this by stepping back, <coughs> showing you a much simpler model where we can see exactly what to do, and then explaining what I need to move from the simple analysis, which I can show you in, in a few slides, 
to the complex analysis, which I can't show you, but I can explain exactly what we do and refer you back to the paper. So I'm going to be in simple <coughs> problem mode, ideas, and then come back to the example. Okay, so let's do a simple example. The simplest possible model is we have one input and one output. Okay, so in this model we have, say, the concentration of a chemical. Maybe it's a biochemical thing at the cellular level, something like that. Okay, so uh, there's a rate parameter that, co that, that determines how this concentration will evolve. So we write down a model for it. So maybe we write down a differential equation. For example, that one on, on the left, which is so happens that we can get a solution for, which is convenient because it will make it easier for me to show you what's going on. Now, for the more complex models, of course, we do not have an explicit solution. So anything I show you has to eventually work when I take the solution away. Okay? <coughs> we need an initial condition to start this off. And we want to learn about the rate parameter x, how fast it increases. So we're going to make an observation. Okay? So here's one model one with a particular choice of the inputs. So the rate parameter here is 0.4. So the x-axis is time and the y-axis is concentration. Okay? Now we could choose different uh, possible choices of the rate parameter. Here's five choices which give us five possible curves. Okay? We could be on any one of those curves. We're going to get some information by making a measurement. Here's us making a measurement at time 3.5. Uh, the measurement isn't a point measurement, it kind of has a measurement error attached to it. Okay. So the question is, what does that tell us about the, uh, 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 the choices of rate parameter? Now, of course, to do this exactly is quite a subtle and complicated question, but informally we can say things like, well, the, the, uh, the purple one at the top and the red one at the bottom don't seem to fit that very well. The blue and the yellow one don't seem to fit so well either. Probably we're lurking around the green. So if we think about the question about what, what choices of parameter values are consistent with what we've seen, how might we do that? Okay. So what we're now going to do is let's... Okay, so we're going to forget about the fact that it's a time plot and just think about things happening at t equals 3.5. So we're now going to make this an out... So, so our output will be a single quantity... Okay, a function just of the rate parameter. And so for different choices of the rate parameter, we will have different concentrations at t equals 3.5. So there we are. So now it's rate parameter on the x-axis and concentration at t equals 3.5 on the y-axis. Okay. So there we have our measurement. There we have <coughs> the measurement errors. Okay. So uh, the uncertainty in the measurement has induces uncertainty in, in the rate parameter. Okay. And so effectively, we could do more complicated things, but basically, we can drop those lines there. And we can see that there's a kind of a range, uh, and exactly how wide you make it is an interesting question, but basically there's a range of green values which are consistent with what we're seeing, and a bunch of red values which are not. Okay. Now, let me... This picture is really important, but let me just move on just one little bit here. Okay. Let's imagine that what I'm interested in is what will happen to the concentration further along in time. Okay. So beforehand, it could have been any one of those places going out. Okay. But effectively what's happened is that to be consistent with what we saw before, we're kind of on one of these uh, uh, sort of lines that's been constrained. So the observations will constrain the future. If we have like parameters that can uh, uh, influence this, <coughs> then they can influence the direction afterwards, but they have to be consistent with getting through that first bump there. Okay? So now coming back to here, so everything springs off being able to do this, and then possibly doing it better, but doing that thing. Okay? So we draw the curve, and we drop it down, and we, or we have our, 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 the consistent values. Okay? So now supposing I let you now stop right now, okay? and you went away and said, well, okay, I've got a method, let me try doing it on my model. Okay? Now, um, obviously some of you will have models, others of you can just imagine uh, that you're working with a complex model and uh, you, you, you try to do this just because uh, yeah, you, it seems interesting enough. Okay? So you will face three fundamental difficulties in following what I've just done. Okay? So the first difficulty is you won't be able to draw the curve. 
because your model is expensive, each individual run. I mean, so I put all the points on so it was easy for me to draw the curve. Okay? You won't be able to do that because your model will take you a long time to run. Imagine running a climate model, even running a disease model. It's, you know, it takes quite a long time for any individual point. Okay? So you can't draw the curve. Let's suppose you could draw the curve. Then see, this one is dead easy to invert. It just goes up like that. Sure. But of course, we have many possible. We have many inputs. We have many outputs. The curve has weird sort of bendy shapes. So even if you could draw the curve, <coughs> you couldn't do the inversion. Okay. Very clever people spend their entire lives inverting much much simpler functions than the kind that come out of the complex models that we build. Okay. So you can't draw the curve. You can't do the inversion. And let's suppose you could do the curve and you could do the inversion, are you done? Not yet, because even then, all you've actually done is you've done the analysis for the model. And that's not the same as the analysis for the world. So supposing you can identify good ways of controlling what the model does, okay? For example, you, you can control disease in the model. Does that mean that you can control disease in the world? No, because that's yet a different point. Okay. So everything about the subject that I do effectively hits one of those three points. Either I'm trying to draw the curve, or I'm trying to do the inversion, or I'm trying to lift that and put it back into the world. Okay. And why I say there is a common methodology is because every problem has those three features. Okay. And as soon as you have a complex model, you have to do this. So my message to you is that there is help each one of these things. There is theory and there are ideas that can help us to do this. And so I will quickly outline, sort of headline things about this. Okay. <coughs> so different theory models vary in many aspects. The formal structures are, uh, are very similar, which is why there's a theory. Because each one of them has those three questions and the methods will be the same. Okay, so each simulator is a function. It takes inputs, the properties of the system, and it gives outputs the behavior of the system. Okay, and what we want to know are what are appropriate choice of inputs, how informative is the output at those appropriate inputs for the system. If we have historical observations, that can test our model if we can't match it at all. That's a problem. If it can match, it will constrain our model, and that's important as well. And if we have decision inputs, we want to optimize. Okay. So, oh, so let me have one. Okay, this is a Bayesian talk. I kind of take it for granted. I am a subjective Bayesian. Whenever I talk about uncertainty, it is an uncertainty is the statement of probability of an individual. My uncertainty statement may be different from yours, may be different from yours. My aim is to help people to make informed uncertainty statements which they have confidence in and which they can explain. So the Bayesian approach unifies and synthesizes all the different sources. If I think, for example, about climate science, I want to have an uncertainty for uh, global mean temperature in 100 years' time. There are so many kinds of uncertainty coming into that. The notion of doing anything apart from a subjective judgment in f done with careful information and put together, that is the only way I can do it. Okay? So, it, without question, we should do a Bayes analysis. Okay? If the problem is quite simple, we have a small number of inputs, a small number of outputs, the function isn't too bad, a, a, a full Bayes analysis will work fine. I strongly recommend that's how to do it. In large problems like climate change, or even like the one that we've, we, I'm talking about, the full base calculation can be complicated because, <coughs> in a sense, it's a, it just asks too much for you. It's, you. You have to specify probabilities at such a fine level of detail. I mean, in <coughs> Stevenson, you just had a single sort of like quantity which you had to get the information about. As we build these things up, we have very high dimensional specifications, which are hard for people to make meaningfully. So I'm just going to comment here that part of that is because hard problems are hard. Part of it is because probability, in a sense, is a bit too demanding. So I'm just pointing out on this slide, and then I'll leave it, that we have to, to explain how come I wrote a book about something. Okay? So the Bayes linear approach uses expectation rather than probability as a primitive. So with probability as primitive, you have to specify everything. With expectation as primitive, you can pick the individual quantities that you're, you, you're interested in, and you make those expectation statements, and you build an analysis from that. 
So this approach is similar in spirit to full base. It is intending to do the same thing, but it's a much simpler approach to uh, uh, specification and analysis. So it's a good alternative. Okay? So everything that I've done in all my applications, in all the references, I do not get involved in hard MCMC problems, and they are very hard for these things because I have a kinder and gentler way of doing it. Okay? Obviously, it raises many questions. And then, so there's a book, Bayesian Statistics, that will tell you in great detail. Here's a very short thing, Bayesian Analysis, a seven-page article in the very interesting Wiley Stats Ref Statistics Reference Online, which is full of stuff. You'll easily get distracted if you jump into it, because it, it's all full of stuff, but there are seven pages if you're interested in, in seeing that there are alternatives to the hard cut. Anyway, we have to quickly move on. Okay, so... I have to draw the curve, I have to do the inversion, and I have to link that to, uh, to reality. I think about five minutes on each. Okay. So if the function is expensive, so we can't evaluate it everywhere we'd like to, because we can't, uh, 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 yeah, just, be, just because it's expensive, okay, then the function is uncertain as well. Even if it's a deterministic function, I evaluate the function for some choices of inputs. Everywhere I haven't evaluated it, I am uncertain about what it is. I saw, so I have to construct a description of uncertainty about the function everywhere. Okay. And that's often called an emulator. So an emulator contains an approximation to the function and a notion of how the, the, the magnitude of the error contained therein. Okay. So the key thing here is that, <coughs> unlike the function, the emulator is fast to evaluate. So anywhere I would have liked to use the function, but I can't, like drawing the curve, I can, use, I can, uh, I can choose the emulator, okay, and uh, I can put the emulator instead of the function, which I can evaluate very fast, and then I, can, I know how much error I'm making. I carry that forward. That's the plan, and it's an effective plan. What does an emulator look like? There are many, many ways that you can emulate uh, uh, computer models. Here's a very common way. We divide the emulation into two parts. Imagine, for example, we're looking at the disease model. Then we have these rate parameters. So if you increase them, you know, basically sort of infections go up and in sort of fairly smooth ways. So the idea is you fit a smooth function sort of through the heart of the shape, and then you pick up the residual that you've missed. Okay. So the first part of that is a smooth function. For example, a polynomial expansion in uh, uh, some of the, uh, the inputs. I'm taking a particular output. For example, the HIV incidence at a particular year. I'm, I'm representing that. That depends. As I change the inputs, I change the model. I change the output. Okay? So I, I, I write down a, a polynomial fit okay, in those things. Okay? So that's what I call the global variation, because I can learn about it from points all over. F is continuous function. My approximate is continuous, therefore the distance is continuous. So I've now got a continuous residual. It has no structure left because that would have gone into my global. So I have a random function, okay, and I just need to describe beliefs about that. So I think about its mean everywhere will be zero. If it's not zero, I put that into the global. The variance, for example, I might say is the same everywhere. Okay, and I now just need to represent the fact that any two points that are close together are going to be very similar, because it's a continuous function, and as I move away, then the correlation between the values becomes smaller. So I will write down something like a correlation structure which has that property. So the technical term is a weekly second-order stationary stochastic process. I might put extra information on, like I might say everything is Gaussian and have what's called a Gaussian process. But the point is, I do a probabilistic modelling for the residual. Okay, so I have the, 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 the global part, which I can learn about from anywhere, and the local part where I get up close and I find out about it. Okay, there we go. So let's do it for the example very quickly. Okay, so here's our five points, and I drew a curve before because I pretended I knew the answer. But now let's suppose I don't. I'm taking the thing away. Here's me now doing an emulation by fitting it. Okay. The blue line here is my expected value of my emulator, and then the red lines here are, say, three standard error bars. Okay? You see, no standard, no, no variance where I've observed. Uncertainty grows as I move further, further away. Okay. Okay. 
So here's me now doing my history machine. There's my data and uh, my errors. And see, so uh, I do exactly the same thing that I did before, but with my emulator instead of my, uh, 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 my function. And of course, I have more uncertainty now because I have uncertainty around the function. But that's OK. I can take account of that. Okay. So how do I do this thing? There is a subject of emulator fitting. You can imagine that is the kind of thing the statisticians do. We take a series of runs of the model. You evaluate some parameter choices. And for each parameter choice, you get your outputs. And you then effectively, you can't quite press a button, emulator go. But you can, I mean, it is a standard statistical modeling problem, which statisticians are very good at doing. OK, so, so should we just say that there's a literature and you can find out about it? OK, now, this requires a certain number of runs of the model. Supposing it's very complicated and expensive, the model, then we often build fast surrogates. So we build, I mean, so how, I mean, to do a Bayes analysis, you need a good prior. Often we get that prior by simplifying the model down, doing many runs on the, the fast model, which is now fast, so we can do that. We have an informed prior that will go to an informed posterior. Okay. The, the, the subject of good space filling designs to do this. And <coughs> how can we be confident that we've done a reasonable job? We have a careful set of diagnostic tools. For example, we hold some points out. We say that the, the emulator is meant to tell us for any individual point what would it, you know, roughly what area should it be in. So we then we try new points and we see how well it does. So the, so the thing is finished by the diagnostic testing. Okay, so we now have the curve. We now want to do the inversion. Okay. So now this is like model calibration. You notice I'm not using the word calibration. This calibration is trying to identify the unique true value of, of the inputs. We have data. We're trying to say what unique true value of the inputs led to that data. I am often uncomfortable with that. It's a model. Why should we think the model has a unique true value? It might well be that some values are better, uh, of the inputs are better at capturing some features of the output. Other choices of inputs are better at choosing other features of the output. That's certainly the case for climate models. Okay. It could be that there are no good choices of inputs, maybe, in which case the pretense that there is would, 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 be, would lead us into error. And just finally, as a technical point, to do the full Bayes analysis, the, the likelihood function that goes into this is horrible. It's very, very multimodal. It very much depends on what your prior judgments are at the level of things that you may be unhappy to specify. So the full Bayes analysis may not be pleasant to do. So <coughs> something that I often do, and people I work with, once they get to know this, they think, oh, that's good. I, I, I like doing it, and they're happy usually with this is what's called history matching. So history matching is I have data, I try to find the collection of input parameters with the following property. Okay, if I run the function at that, at that choice of parameters, does the output corresponding to the history, is it roughly the same to within the errors that I've got? <coughs> if I do, I say that choice history matches. If it's far away, I say it doesn't history match. So I look for the collection of all of the, the reasonable history matching choices. Okay. And this will usually be a fairly small part of the parameter space. So even if I wanted to calibrate, I would probably do this first, and then I would decide whether to go on. Okay. So is, is that clear what that is? I, it is clear, I think. I mean, that is a history match. Okay. The green bit there is a, a history match. So the green is, is, you know, is within sort of error. The red part we can take away. It does not history match. Okay. Now, so what we're doing here is what we're, we're looking at is we're doing, we have some implausibility criterion to throw out the red points. So for what we're doing is really we're comparing the blue line to the black line and we're saying are they close? And what we mean by close is let's count how much variation there is and see are they too far apart to be explained by variation. Okay. So there it is. So Z is a, is a black line, it's what we observe. The expected value of f is the, uh, the, blue, the blue point, and the variance is that distance. So in, in a single one-dimensional thing, you can just look at it. However many dimensions we have, we can do this calculation. Okay. So we can either do it on 
each output at a time, or we can bundle them up. We can look at the max of them. We, there are many things we can do. Again, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's not a recipe, it's, a, it's an idea that you bring to your problem. Then, so you've done this, so I have a green set and a red set is at the end. Well, not particularly, so I come back to here, okay? Because, I mean, it could be that plenty of some of the points in the green thing here are only there because of my emulation error. So if I continue, maybe I can get rid of that. Okay, so what I do is I make a second set of simulator runs within the green set, I refit my emulators, and then I see, can I further reduce? And I keep on doing that until I've reduced. Okay. So here we are, we're in the green set. Okay. So now, I don't care about anything of, of the red, that's gone. I'm just going to take more points in the green set and refit my emulator. There we are, so here's me doing it. And, oops, and there I can stop, okay? Which makes the key point here that when I start, emulating is quite hard. There's lots of errors over the whole space. I don't have to emulate the whole function over the whole space very accurately. That would be hugely hard. I just need to emulate it accurately in the green bit, okay? So, uh, and so, so, so again, history matching is an attempt, well, is a method for focusing your attention on where you need to understand what the function is. Oh, I'm now ready to talk a little bit about the, uh, 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 the example again. So we have our uh, 18 uh, outputs, 22 inputs. We want to emulate and history match. So we do a 220 point Latin hypercube design. So that's a kind of a nice space filling design. You, you, you can read about that if you like. Okay, and we hold an extra 20 points aside for validation. Okay. So our global fit was basically a qubit in many of the variables, which we identify and then we fit from our 220 runs. We validate the emulators by doing them on our trial set. Now, all the emulators in the first wave validate, except for a couple that we put aside. So there are a couple that we can't emulate yet, but that's fine, because we'll pick them up later, and in later ways we do. So for history matching, what we would like to do is we, we have 18 outputs we would like to match, so we would like to run our function everywhere, okay? and for each value of, the f for, of, of our inputs, compare the function output to the 18 values we have. We can't do that because it's very expensive. We can do it for the emulator, so we take... 5.5 times 10 to the 8 points, we draw from a uniform distribution on 22 space, okay? And we uh, measure the implausibility, i.e. are they in the red set or the green set, for each one of those points, okay? We reject if the maximum implausibility is too big. And let's now point out this took five minutes. Okay, we had a cluster, okay? So we can... So, so when I say that we replace the, the, the function by the emulator, it is a practical thing to do. Okay? Now, is it effective? So we had 5.5 times 10 to the 8 potential points that could be in, this, in the set. Only 21,000 passed the implausibility test. So, ev so uh, everything else was read and is stripped away. Okay? So we can see, uh, even on our first <coughs> pass, that the, the non-implausible space at this wave is of size four times 10 to the minus five of the original space. It's a tiny part. So we repeat that through 10 waves. Well, I say Yanis did, I, I mean, he, he, would, he just carried on doing it. You, you resample, refit, and carry on. And in the end, we get down to 10 to the minus 11 of the original space, very small part. And in this space, in this very small space, about a bit more than a half of the runs actually match all of our, quant our outputs to a good order of uh, approximation. Okay. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to do. We're trying, so we now have a good range of, of, of inputs which match, which we can use for whatever purposes we want to later on, usually for thinking about if we intervene, what will happen. Now, let me just show you one picture to give you some more understanding of that. Okay, so here's the kind of pictures we look at. So the left-hand side is, is HIV prevalence among males. The right-hand side is HIV prevalence among females. There's years along uh, uh, the x-axis. So our model, we put a, a set of choices of our parameters in, we run, and it gives many outputs, 
and in particular it gives us HIV prevalences on a year by year basis. Okay? Now, uh, different choices, of each, each one of those stringly things is a, is a run at a particular choice of parameters because we're running lots of them, they sort of they, they overlay a bit. Okay? Now, the targets we're trying to hit, in fact, we had three prevalences of HIV for men and three for women. So there are the little dots at the bottom. So they are data points with, with calibration sort of ranges depending on our, our judgment about measurement error. Okay. So a good run should actually, should, when we draw the line, should fall inside the, uh, sort of the, ba the black bands for each of those six points plus the other 12 things we're trying to match. Okay. So now wave one is red. We can see that most of those points are hopeless. They're very far away. Okay. Wave four is the yellow. We can see it's starting to become uh, a bit more serious. You know, they're not so far away. Wave seven is the blue. And you can see that now we're sort of starting to hone in on the space. And wave 10 is the green. And now most of the ones are within. And they're within for these points and for the other uh, 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 12 values as well. So that's what history matching is doing. It's asking the question, you know, can we find inputs which we do which match everything. And if we can't find any, of course, it raises questions about the model. And so it's a process. Let me quickly move on, because I've now talked about the curve and the inversion. My final question is, I've done this for the model, what do I do about the world? So very quickly, the limitations of physical models. A model tells you about how system properties influence system behavior. So there are two types of simplification that we've made. Firstly, we simplify the properties, because we don't know them and they're complicated. Secondly, we simplify the rules by which properties turn into behaviour, because they're complicated and we don't know them. Now, all models do that. That's just what models do. That's why models are useful. If they did the full complexity, we probably couldn't cope with them. They, they would do that, okay? So that doesn't invalidate the modelling process at all. That's what we've been trying to achieve, is to get simplifications that capture quite a lot you know, without losing, you know, without drowning us, okay? The problem only arises when we forget these simplifications and confuse the model analysis with the analysis of the system, okay? Now, who would make such a confusion? Who could possibly make such a confusion? And the answer is everybody. Every single person who... I, I remember I've worked in many areas with many scientists in many fields, and they all do. Everybody sort of said, they're very happy. They, they, people are delighted that I can draw the curve for them. They're delighted that we can do the inversion. They say, oh, do I really have to worry about, you know, none of my colleagues are worrying about, you know, we just analyze the model, man. Okay, so the question, see, people think that validation of the model sort of gets them off the hook, but the model isn't right or wrong. A model is something that helps us to reduce our uncertainty about the world, and it does it to the extent that we've figured out, not if it's right or wrong, it's not right. I mean, it's, a, it's an approximation. It, it, it helps us when we've assessed how much it reduces our uncertainty about the world. What are we allowed to do in order to, to use this? Okay? So one should always have this picture in mind. We, the real things are the model evaluations we've done, the system observations, and there's a real system sitting in between. So we have kind of meta-built uh, a model and a system input. Okay? We're adding discrepancy and we're adding error, measurement error. So some version of that picture should be our starting point. Okay. Well, let's just finish off the inversion thing, just because, uh, for, for very simply, okay, so there was our curve before. Okay. And basically, uh, measurement error goes around uh, the observation. Uh, 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 discrepancy error goes around the curve itself. And the discrepancy error is a complicated thing that has correlation across time. For example, if my model underpredicts now, I go into the future, what's the chance it will underpredict in the future? Okay, so it's the, the, the uncertainty at each point and the correlation structure that is what allows me to lift statements about my model to statements about the world. Now, obviously it's a huge question. I have just a bit under five minutes to do this. So <coughs> what can I say about this? Obviously, many, many, many things. I'm just going to give you one prop for dividing, because there are many ways you can slice discrepancy. The way that I find most useful is to describe, divide it into <coughs> internal discrepancy and external discrepancy. I'm going to give you one slide on each, and then I'll, I'll conclude. 
So internal discrepancy are those features of the model discrepancy that you can explore by experiments on the model. Okay. So there are things you can do. So uh, a, a, a parameter that you hold fixed in time, you can let it drift. You could have a forcing function you could add noise to. If the state vector is propagated, you could add a little bit of noise to that propagation. There are experiments on the... Mo if the model is well written, it will allow you to experiment on it in such a way that you can understand inherent sort of like differences between your model and the world. Okay? So you should think about that as carefully as you can. Okay? And this is something you can compute. It's something you can do. Okay? Because you're doing these experiments, it automatically gives you a relationship between discrepancy now and discrepancy in the future. Because each experiment, you can see whether highs in experiment now lead to highs in experiments in the future. So how do you actually assess it? You take some individual parameter values, you choose your experiments, huge topic, how you do that. But you do, you, you, so, so for each of those individual parameter values, you do a series of experiments, you get a notion of a discrepancy variance at those values. If they're about all the same, you say find that discrepancy variance. If they vary, what do you do? Well, you have uh, discrepancy variance at certain points. You emulate discrepancy variance across the model. Okay, so just as you emulate the model, you emulate the uncertainty caused by this. Okay? So here's something you can actually do. The second part, having said internal, the rest of it is external. So external is all this stuff that is uh, uh, not something that, is, that you can learn by, by manipulating the model. So, if, for example, there's some missing physics, yeah? you can't get at that missing physics by uh, 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 any operations on the model itself. It has to come from uh, expert judgment, from modelling, and from estimation. For example, if you say the model is great, but you've now done a careful exploration and all your fits are terrible, you can estimate that your discrepancy is not small, in fact, it's large. Okay? So the simplest way is, and this is something we often do, is you just ask roughly how much di extra discrepancy would you like to put on. So people can think about that. They can think about which outputs are more reliable in their judgment, which are less. And they can give you numbers, like 10% extra to add on. Okay? And it's simple, but it's much, much better than ignoring it altogether. Okay? Ignoring discrepancy is terrible. Doing a simple thing is, you know, it, it gets you a reasonable way there. And so, obviously, it is better, just as it's better to model than to not model, it's better to model the difference between uh, 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 sort of your model and the real world, and that's possible to do. You think about all the features that you know are missing, you think about the effects they're likely to have, you, you, build, you, you, you express your judgments for this, you express them in probability or expectation terms. Okay? And so you, you imagine uh, it's like a more careful simulator, which has incorporated all these things. You can't build that, you can't run that simulator, you can't even build it unless you have like, loads more budget, but you can imagine it and therefore you can emulate it. And so as a side comment at the end, when you've done all these very complicated, hard to imagine, but you could do them things, okay, then all the code you had before that used emulators and linked them to data your code will still be waiting for you, and you just say, actually, no, my emulator needs to correspond to these extra differences. Okay? So a huge topic, but one that is, if, if you actually care about your answers for the world, okay, and you actually, for example, you want to help people who actually have diseases, rather than people in your model, you know, is this a good intervention? You know, is, is, is this a natural hazard? Will this actually save people's lives? You should think about these things, and there are ways that you can. Okay, so concluding comments. Oh. Okay, so there is a general Bayesian methodology. It affects, it's related to life science models, it's related to all models. There are three basic points I've emphasized. Firstly, you can emulate the simulator, which allows you to explore the whole behavior of the function. Secondly, you can do history matching, which allows you to do the inversion. It allows you to find what is the quality of the fit and under what subspaces. And finally, the structural discrepancy modelling, which is what you do in order to be able to relate your model to the world. So I'll leave you with a few references. So here are various aspects, things that have explored different parts of this. And if you have any interest, you can follow up with these. Or you can start with the one that I put up before about uh, the infectious diseases. Okay. Let me skip back to that, because that's my uh, good thing to look at. 
and thank you for your time. That was much appreciated. So obviously there's, there's insight and there's doing stuff. Yeah, okay. So firstly that the emulator, because it allows you to explore what the function does, will start identifying for you what are the driving inputs, so you'll see which ones are the important ones. Yeah. Secondly, when you look at the shape of the, f of the, the, the space that remains, that gives you an insight in sense what trade-offs there are. For example, if you know, in order to match, x1 has to be big, or if x1 is big, x2 has to be small. So, yeah. so, you know, so each piece of output <coughs> you know, is part of an analysis that gives you those kind of insights as well. Yeah. Okay. And then you can see, because you can see like, what you can't get very well, Another driver to say what things, if I were to observe them, would effectively resolve more uncertainty. So it, 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 is, it is a framework for exploring everything. And obviously, it leads to actions at the end because it's a good framework. But on the way, you, you, you are supposed to look at this critically. No? Mm -hmm. uh, when you had the points that you were fitting to, um, and you had the sort of standard errors or whatever they were. Yeah. Were those just naive frequency standard errors about They were based on uh, 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 sort of, well, they were naive but complicated in the sense that the prevalence was, was, was I mean, so what we see here, of course, is, say, women and men, but of course that is broken down, because remember we're doing it over, over, over subgroups, over people, where we have a, a joint cohort estimation, so we've estimated them every year, yep. And we, 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 we have subgroups which we can estimate codes these things in. Okay. So <coughs> uh, uh, I, a lot of work went into, into, into those errors. Yeah? And in a sense they're naive, but in another sense I think that's the least of it. I mean, it's much more the questions are about things like, well, have we got enough of the complexity of what's really happening in order to do this? And so the first thing they were interested in is, could we, what, you know, can, can we capture this? And so what happens, I mean, you know, this is part of like a long story, obviously, and uh, you know, we, we, we can now say, you know, once we've actually fitted these things here, you know, are there other features, because they have very rich data sets, you know, does this, you know, does this fit other things as well? You know, do we need to further refine the model? You know, what features of behavior can we capture, and does that make us feel that we've actually got it right, or is it like right by coincidence? Uh, all the usual questions. But yeah, I mean, a lot of work went into it, but they were not Bayes intervals. So obviously they were naive by that definition. But it's an interesting question. Sure, yes. Uh, uh, some follow-up question is, I presume for your actual simulation, did you assume a closed population, or did you, mm. did you allow this Uganda to interact with the rest of the world as well? Well, uh, it, it was relatively closed. But that's because I think that the, the, the actual villages they were looking at were relatively closed. So now, when we talk about external thing, okay, there are questions about whether you can actually represent as a probabilistic model the effect of, uh, of people com coming out and going in. So, for example, oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, so uh, there's <coughs> that paper near the end as a discussion of, 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 of uh, it's like, it's called uh, Rayified Bayesian Modeling, okay, where we do a compartmental model for, uh, uh, for uh, Gulf Stream collapse, okay, and we have a certain number of boxes, and we think, yeah, but in fact, the, the circle, because of the model we were using, because it was quite limited, because it went round like that, but of course, water can actually go out other places, so we model our, our, our judgment about that, yeah? So, my understanding is that this is a closed model, and the, the, the really, mm, that's one of the things that you can't, well, I have to, you could only explore that as an internal calculation by doing something dead clever. But you can model, you know, and, and, and again with all these things, it's a judgment how much you go to the level of modeling and how you, you say, oh, about 10%. You know? As with every model you ever do, you know, the, the, some things you do carefully, other things you just put into a, a, a watch of stuff.
to ask, <coughs> you talk about calibration, mm -hmm. and I've spoken to other Bayesians, and they don't believe in calibration. No. They say it's a belief. And therefore... But you notice I didn't calibrate. But you do. Didn't no, you? I find... You mentioned the word at the time. I, I use the word, but then I step back from it, and I say, <laughs> yeah, because what I'm interested, so, so eventually, so for instance, so rather than forecasting, we tend to look at the, the set of futures, the words I use, which are consistent with, okay, our, uh, what we've observed in the, in the past, with the, the, the physics, biology, or whatever embodied in the model, and our notion of the limitations of all of those, yep. So that we, uh, I tend to sort of look at the, sort of the range of, 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 eventually that's why I like showing you the fan, yeah? And then on top of that fan, I build a further fan when I put in my uh, uh, model discrepancy and I say, you know, you know, you, you know, if you're sort of in, you know, if, if that whole region, you know, it, it, it is quite good, then you should be quite happy. But if it's actually quite widely spread, you know, that is a point where you actually need to get more information or you need to uh, 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 change your policies. But it's not based on the idea that there is a true but unknown value. It could be. I mean, I, I could calibrate them. I mean, the more this model really, really represents a thing, for example, I mean, if I, I was looking at people who are getting radiation doses, then the input would be their radiation dose. And I really would want to know what their radiation dose was. So if that input was a thing that I want, really wanted to learn about, then my final step would be to calibrate, yes. The thing is, we're talking about such a wide range of problems here that they all have their own individual features, but it's a framework that will start you off on almost anything. <coughs>